Well, good morning, afternoon, and evening, everyone. The New Media Consortium and Learning Revolution are pleased to welcome you to a half-day thought panel discussion that will explore the most disruptive ideas and trends for academic and research libraries around the globe. I'm Holly Ledgate, the Senior Director for Program Development at the NMC, and I'm honored to welcome you to our first NMC Virtual Symposium for the Future of Libraries. The NMC is an international community of experts in educational technology, from the practitioners who work with the new technology on the campuses and museums and in libraries every day, to the visionaries who are shaping the future of learning at think tanks and labs and research centers to its staff and board of directors, and to the experts and panels and others that help the NMC conduct cutting-edge research. You can learn more and formally join the NMC's vast community at nmc.org. This event is actually brought to you by the NMC Academy. The NMC Academy, if you've not checked it out, is a fresh approach to accelerate professional learning for educators, among others, providing personalized and powerful mini-courses that transform different teaching practices and learning experiences. The NMC Academy is free online mini-courses hosted by a variety of educational institutions and specifically designed for educators and others serving students grades 6 through 16. You can learn more and enroll in these free courses at academy.nmc.org. Now, during the next few hours, we're going to be investigating four major themes that were found in the NMC's Horizon Report 2014 for the Library Edition. A few of these interactive panels, emphasis on mobile, content management and technical infrastructure, increasing access and discovery opportunities, and finally, rethinking the roles and relationships of library professionals. I am so pleased that you are participating in our symposium, and I hope that it is a fabulous learning experience for you today. I also want to thank you for being here, and I know it takes a lot of work to dedicate yourself for a half-day professional development. This program will be live and recorded for future access. We encourage all of our tweeters to use our hashtag today at NMCHZ, and we will be connecting this program with global conversations on the NMC Horizon project, specifically the library report today. We will be holding 45-minute panels discussing these topics with experts from around the globe. You will also notice a moderator for each panel, which is our very own NMC staff, and they will help distill the Horizon report into that living, breathing document that is brought to you. So a few housekeeping items to get the day started. You should all have a packet that was sent uh, via link to you earlier before this session, and the schedule is included, the agenda for today, on pages four and five. In the next few weeks, you will also be receiving a certificate for this event, as well as a badge for your Academy profile. You can feel free to utilize the unified chat talk to the right, and I see so many of you already have. We've had some great conversation going. Also, you can raise your hand during these sessions with questions. So sit back and relax. If you want to go full screen and just enjoy the presentation, you can click the four arrows in the right corner of the video that you're seeing, and F11 for full screen video. Along with myself, Alex Freeman, Samantha Adams, Victoria Estrada, and the NMC will be moderating the panels for this event today. And also, during our breaks that we have, we're going to be posing a question that typically is posed to the Horizon Panel Advisory Board, that we want you to continue the discussion during the breaks, if you have time, via Twitter using our hashtag, NMCHZ. So without further ado, let's go ahead and head into the show. And first, we're starting with the emphasis on mobile panel. Good morning, everyone. My name is Alex Freeman. I'm the director of special projects at the NMC and the co-author of the Horizon Report Library Edition. So I'm very pleased to welcome you to our, our meeting today, our, our 45 minutes. Uh, we'll have a little bit more time today because we got an early start. Um, 45 minutes of discussion with some of the brightest minds in the library world. Um, today we're focusing on mobiles. And uh, to give you a, a, some background, the, uh, the library experience is no longer confined to the four walls of the physical structure. 
Devices such as smartphones, tablets, and e-readers are capturing a larger share of the information market. In this session, a panel of experts will explore the current mobile landscape across libraries and the increasing need for more effective mobile strategies. So I want to turn it over to our experts. Uh, one by one, I'm going to introduce them. They're going to give us uh, a little bit of background on their bio and then talk specifically about um, how their, um, their involvement with mobiles in their library or, or library research. So first is, um, is Geneva Henry, university librarian and vice provost for libraries from George Washington University. Good morning, everyone. Um, so I'm at George Washington University, and uh, I've been here a little over a year. Um, my, you know, my experience with mobiles, I've been at Rice University before coming to GW. Um, my perspective has shifted a bit. When I was at Rice, um, I was running the uh, digital library programs there and digital scholarship. Um, and there was a big focus on content, so making sure that uh, the content could be readily delivered with mobiles, that um, it, we were packaging information so it could download efficiently over wireless you know, networks, um, presenting it in the right way. Um, and now with my move over to GW as Vice Provost for Libraries here, um, that certainly that perspective is still there, but it's broadened quite a bit. Uh, so the need to really think about the uh, mobile infrastructure that we're providing, you know, are we providing as libraries the right kind of power in our buildings? Uh, the, you know, do we have enough uh, wireless access points? Um, how are we using uh, this in instruction? How are we really thinking about um, how students are uh, using their their mobiles in their day-to-day -day lives and then translating that uh, into how they're uh, doing their research and how they're uh, writing uh, and all of the things we do uh, in libraries to support them. So it really is um, a realization for me and I think a, you know a reality that uh, mobiles and libraries are um, quite essential um, from the infrastructure to the how they use it uh, in support of everything that they're doing. Well, thank you, Geneva. Welcome, welcome to the panel. Uh, next, we have Brian Kelly. He's an innovation advocate at CETUS, the University of Bolton in the UK. Okay, thank you for that introduction. Can you hear me okay? Can yeah, you hear me? Great. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, I'm Brian Kelly. For over 18 years, I've worked as a technology advisor for UK universities, initially at UConn at the University of Bath, and for the past year as the innovation advocate at CETUS, University of Bolton. Um, over recent years, I've been interested in, particularly in use of mobile devices at conferences, particularly for researchers to support their engagement with fellow researchers, maximize the impact of their ideas, and to develop new professional relationships. Um, I actually created the Amplified Conference Wikipedia article after my former director, Lorcan Dempsey, coined the term. Lorcan, I think, will be well known by many people. He's now at uh, OCLC. And so it's that always connected aspect of mobile devices which is a particular interest to me and I think is also particularly relevant for researchers when they're attending conferences. Okay, thank you, Brian. Now moving on to Joan Lippincott. Joan Lippincott is the Associate Executive Director of the Coalition for Networked Information, CNI. Oh, okay. Take it away, Joan. I'm the Associate Executive Director at the Coalition for Networked Information, which is a joint program of the Association of Research Libraries and EDUCAUSE. And so we want to bring together the interests of libraries and information technology in the digital environment. Um, we're really interested in both the types of content uh, that libraries will want to offer or are offering uh, formatted for mobile devices and the types of services for uh, the user community, particularly in universities. We're interested in thinking beyond the standard modes of libraries represented on mobile devices, things like catalogs and hours, and especially want to look at the way contents and devices are related to teaching, learning, and research. 
Last summer, um, I did one of the keynotes at the International M Libraries Conference, and my talk was titled, Looking to the Future in Teaching and Learning, Making a Commitment or Sitting on the Sidelines. And I was uh, expressing my concern that libraries need to be more out outwardly focused in understanding developments in departments and schools or colleges curriculum. For example, iPad initiatives or use of mobile devices in clinical work in the health sciences. What are the information needs? Who's looking at class texts and other information material, including things like media that may already be licensed by the library? And I really believe that libraries need to seek partnerships with departments, teaching and learning centers, and other professionals working in this arena, along with faculty. And last but not least is Gary Price. Uh, Gary Price is an American librarian and currently the co-editor of InfoDocket, now part of Library Journal of Media Source and Full Text reports.com. Gary, tell us a little bit about yourself and your involvement with mobiles. Good morning, everyone. I have been interested in working in the mobile and followable arena, both in libraries and in the bigger world, um, since about 1999-2000. So I've been, this is an issue that I've been following for about 14 years or so. Um, two things that I'm interested in these days that I think we can hopefully talk on as we move through the day. Three things, actually. One is the merging of the mobile world with the non-mobile world. As uh, Brian said, we live in a world where we're always on, and it doesn't really make a difference what type of device we're on, whether it be a traditional laptop, power, uh, MacBook Pro, that type of thing, or a device. Obviously, the bandwidth in the... Uh, and the size of the screen come into play, but we're always connected. And now with user responsive uh, design, we're seeing less and less emphasis towards, well, this is the mobile site, this is the non-mobile site. Second, uh, are we making the most use of the devices themselves? One area that I've been following for quite a while is what often referred to as uh, camera-based searching, content-based image retrieval. Uh, we're seeing more and more resources coming on uh, online where you snap a picture of something and it does the search. Are we, are we prepared to make the most use of this type of technology and related technologies in a library environment? And third and perhaps foremost is the need for privacy in, this, uh, in, in today's world. Are libraries doing enough about privacy of their users, uh, both in a, in, inside the library, outside the library, are, do, do we provide the education people need uh, that they should have towards uh, in, with, with open Wi-Fi and, and the like? I believe we're not doing enough, and I think we need to move on to do more, but this is especially an issue uh, in the world of mobile devices. Okay. Well, thank you all for giving us a little background on, on what you do and, and what your involvement is with mobiles. Um, I'd like to bring it back to, to the purpose of the Horizon Report, was really looking at teaching and learning uh, and, and the importance for mobiles in that area. You know, when we look at uh, the Horizon Report, we look at trends and challenges and, and technology topics, and all of them are, are, are focused on teaching and learning. So I'd like to kind of pivot to that and, and talk to you all about why, why is this important for teaching, learning, and research? I'll go ahead and uh, start with um, with Geneva. Okay, um, so mobile has changed the game uh, in so many ways. It uh, changes the way people think about research. It think, changes the way people think about what they're doing in class. It offers a lot of opportunity um, to really leverage uh, these devices uh, to do some innovative work. Um, there's no longer a separation of this activity um, of research or learning how to write um, from uh, what people do every day. Uh, what it does enable is to um, let people use those, those devices in ways that make inquiry an ongoing um, part of what they do. So uh, when, when they're out you know, enjoying a concert, when they're out at a museum, um, they've got a device in their hand that allows them to um, make inquiries, um, dig deeper, um, validate the sources that they're reading. 
Uh, so it, it gives them a much richer environment to think, start thinking much more at a, you know, at a high level um, throughout what they're do, doing, which uh, you know, in turn is really engaging them more along the pedagogical and research aspects um, of their lives. They're, just, they're not as separate anymore. Um, as we go into research, it's uh, increasingly a mobile device is increasingly increasingly the tool of choice for gathering data for uh, research, as well as creating that content that will be used for further research. Um, for example, uh, snapping images of um, you know items out in nature, um, creating uh, videos um, of my microscopy images. Um, so I mean, this is you know it, it just it. It changes things uh, from what we used to have before we had so much pervasive mobile. Um, the other aspect that you know we all live with is increasingly with everybody having a smartphone in their hands, everyone has GPS in their hands. Um, so as they look at information and think about uh, content, um, having that available uh, to them gives them a much richer context in which they can think about that information uh, and what they're seeing and what they're learning about. Um, the use of social media um, has changed the whole uh, scholarly communications aspect. Um, how we now disseminate early results increasingly, you know, you're, you're following Twitter, you're, you're reading the blogs. Um, it really, uh, you know, the mobile applications really allow you to keep up um, on what's going on uh, long before the outcomes actually make it to the more traditional um, publication and dissemination outlets. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, let's turn it over to Brian. What, are, what is the impact of mobiles for teaching learning research what, in your world? Well, back in 2011, I gave a seminar on mobile technologies, why should library staff be interested? And this was aimed at library staff at the University of Bath. The slides for that talk are still available and we'll be sharing the URLs later. But in addition, there's a video recording of that talk available. And I created that video myself using a flip camera. Because one of the things I was saying is there's interesting content which we can't easily share. Back then it was with flip cameras, but nowadays many people would have a mobile phone with um, video capabilities and easily uploading capabilities to various video channels. So that was back in 2011 and I think the changes since then are the majority of us do have the, the smart mobile devices, Wi-Fi is pervasive, um, 3G is, is pervasive in many locations. So that, back then I suggested that the important areas were consuming content, reading stuff, creating content such as creating the video recording that I did, the enhancing productivity which was both doing existing things better and also doing new things and also for developing professional relationships. And so since then I've found that the most important aspects of my use of mobile devices is being able to work any time, any place, anywhere. And for me that includes, it used to include working on the bus and the train when I got the bus to work, being connected at conferences, and sometimes even using my mobile device in bed. And so I have a question for the audience which they I'd like them to answer either on the Unified Chat channel or on Twitter. My question is, have you ever used a mobile device for work-related purposes in bed? Do tell me what, you, what your answer to that question is. Thank you. That's a great question, Brian. Um, and please do use the Unified Chat to, uh, to answer questions, to ask questions of our panelists. Uh, we're here for you until the top of the hour to answer any questions that you might have regarding mobiles or to let us know your dirty secrets about where you use your mobiles. Uh, I'm guilty. I use my mobiles everywhere. I use my tablet, um, you know, wherever I can find uh, an internet connection, basically. Um, okay, and uh, let's uh, switch it over to Gary. Gary, tell us a little bit about, um, from the research side, what, what you think. 
Well, I, I really think that in addition to all the things that have been mentioned before, the library can and should be playing a role in the education of users, education of faculty members, education of, uh, of higher ranking officials, and education of ourselves. There's a lot of different technology out there, specifically in this case mobile, that is either unknown or if it is known, not getting the not being taken full advantage of and we have a huge role in this because a lot of times because well, quite frankly there are thousands and thousands and thousands of apps out there and just app discovery is a huge issue not only amongst in our community but for the developers of these apps we should become the go-to libraries should strive to become the go-to place for uh, for mobile education, to make sure that those who use these items, these devices, these tools, are using them to their fullest capabilities. Because a lot of time, as I said a moment ago, there somebody will learn one thing on one of these devices or one or how to use the app one way, and that's all they use. Yet a lot of time, effort, and money are being put in to make these uh, these resources much more robust and then they go unused. I think there's a lot that can be done there and a great way to stay out in front of your of the audience who who visits or might not even visit your library. Okay, thanks Gary. Um, if you notice I, I, I dropped a chat in um, I dropped uh, some links in the chat. I'll be doing that throughout. Um, let's see. Um, and also make sure if you are interested in joining our global conversation, our hashtag is hashtag NMCHZ. That's hashtag mm -hmm. NMCHZ. Let me go ahead and drop, I'm going to drop in um, the link that Brian told us about in terms of the, the video. So I'll go ahead and drop that in there. As well as um, Joan Lippincott, she has a, uh, uh, a presentation from the M Libraries Conference uh, in, in Hong Kong. This past uh, this past May, so I'll go ahead and drop that link there in as well. If you want to uh, uh, browse those while we're while we're going. Okay, so let's uh, let's see. Uh, still still wanting to take any questions that you have. If not, we've got uh, we've got plenty to cover. So our, our next question, and I'll uh, pose. Yeah. Uh, I didn't get a chance to answer this one. Okay, go ahead, Joan. Um, I think that libraries can be part of a strategy to provide a holistic uh, learning environment for students. Uh, we talk um, in some of the run-up to uh, voting in the Horizon Report about personalized learning environments and I think that that's a really um, critical new area for us to be thinking about. Um, and I do believe that tablet devices will become the hardware of choice for many students in universities, even though I'm well aware that right now um, they're not particularly popular. If you survey students, they say they'd rather have a laptop and a smartphone and the tablet comes in a distant third. But I think that's really going to change. And I think there are um, at least two factors that will promote that change. One is as textbooks become more usable in the way that students want them to be usable, on mobile devices. For example, as digital rights management software, DRM, is relaxed so students can do things like print what portions of the text they want or uh, use it in, in other ways. And as the, I think another factor is when I'm in an airport or out, um, you know, in, in running errands, how many times do you see toddlers, very young children, preschool children, who use tablet devices um, as if they're part of their repertoire? And I really do believe that as this generation reaches college age, they will have to have those devices and they'll want them readily available for a variety of functions. And they will use it as a primary tool, both for um, accessing information for their courses, for their assignments, but also creating new content, as other presenters have mentioned, taking photos, making videos, recording podcasts, and sharing through social media. Uh, the next question we have is, uh, do you have mobile use scenario that you think is particularly 
particularly innovative? And uh, I'll pose this question. I'll keep it with Joan. Joan, any any uh, innovative uses that you've seen? Well, one that uh, Geneva, uh, following up on her discussion of the use of mobile devices in research environments and in the field, um, Axie and I, we try to showcase some leading projects at our semi-annual meetings, and I was um, very intrigued by University of Guelph in Canada, their libraries developing a suite of services to support researchers using mobile devices in the field, and one of the projects that they highlighted in a session was a project uh, working with an entomologist who was doing field work in Vietnam and how he was collecting his data and then sending it back uh, you know for uh, data curation at the home institution and how the libraries being becoming involved in working with that researcher and with others and uh, we'll put a link to that presentation in the chat and also there's a video at that uh, URL as well that describes more of that type of work. Uh, one, of the, uh, one of the comments from the audience is expecting DRM to relax, particularly regarding textbooks, seems unlikely to us. Well, I, I think that um, there will be increasing competition um, from open access resources and of course there that won't be as much of an issue. Um, our executive director Cliff Lynch has written about this and talked about the fact that in the e-journals environment we don't have such DRM restrictions and uh, it may be a matter of time before some of those restrictions uh, relax in the textbook market. Now moving it on to uh, another um, innovative use, how about uh, how about you Geneva, have you seen any innovative uses of mobiles um, in your environment or in your um, sure. I, you know, just to uh, piggyback off of what Gary was talking about earlier, um, libraries have an imperative to uh, keep our communities informed about these various uh, technologies, uh, especially mobile technologies, um, and what they're able to, um, you know, the advantages they're able to provide to people. Um, but at the same time, um, not only do we have that imperative to be aware of what they are, how they're used, and really, you know, set them in the context of pedagogy and research, um, but we also have an imperative to uh, leverage uh, what's happening with mobile technology out there and to find ways to uh, make it easier for our, our community uh, to use social media. So a project uh, that we have underway here at GW uh, is something called a uh, the Social Feed Manager project and um, I think it's, it's pretty innovative. Uh, it came about um, after uh, one of our librarians here uh, was uh, working with a faculty member who was gathering uh, Twitter feeds by hand uh, to do uh, some research. And he said, you know, I can automate this for you. So he did, you know, uh, pulling off of the uh, Twitter API. Uh, and then it turned out, uh, this professor said, hey, you know, I've got all these co colleagues who are trying to do this. So um, it uh, gradually, actually very quickly, um, started including a number of different researchers in different fields uh, to um, fill a need that they had of you know, realizing once again that um, the most current information is getting out there through social media, um, especially uh, when you're uh, in the area of uh, understanding uh, policy and politics. That happens real time um, with Twitter. Um, that's where it is. So if you want to do uh, interesting research with the most up-to-date information, that's really where you need to go. So. Um, he developed the social feed manager. We had a, a grant from IMLS, uh, and then we, we have another grant right now. And we are also working with um, Stanford, uh, UC Riverside, and um, uh, uh, University of North Texas on this to provide even more enhance, enhancements um, to the project. Uh, but it is really allowing researchers then to change the way they are um, able to do their research. Uh, it's also a realization that, you know, again, this is how uh, the scholarly record is evolving. It's no longer waiting for, you know, print articles to come out. And it's also a realization that as we're trying to archive 
um, the work at our institutions, you know, it, it's not happening in print papers that people leave behind. It's it's the websites, it's the blogs, it's the Twitter feeds. That's what our students are, are using. So for us as um, archivists to uh, ensure that we're capturing the history of our institutions, um, what we're realizing is we need to capture the Twitter feeds uh, that are now producing that history. Um, so we're looking at all the archival aspects as well of uh, the Twitter feeds as we think a bit about it uh, in terms of the institutional record that's being left behind. Okay, great. Um, anyone I wanted to add to that before I move on to, uh, to Gary? Sure, I will. Um, I like to... We'll, we'll go ahead. I'm sorry, Alex. No, no, no. Go ahead, Gary. Well, I think it's also, and going along with what others have said, to take a look at some perhaps even non-library resources, apps, and, and kind of sit around with your colleagues and others to envision how might this app specifically or this type of technology be used in the library setting. And an exa a couple of examples which I've put on a web page for you. One is something, again, going back to the camera searching idea, uh, that's called PhotoMath. In this app, which is relatively new, the user takes the takes a picture of a um, of an algebraic equation, and within a couple of seconds, the answer to that equation is provided, along with all of the steps used to um, to provide the answer. Another example is something that's been around now for a couple of years, but um, this most most recently, the company that was doing it was acquired by Google. And that is called Word Lens. And what's 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 wonderful about this app and different is that it doesn't require a live internet connection. Basically, you place your camera over text, and in real time, it will do a mechanical translation of the text. For example, from English to Spanish, Spanish to French, that type of thing, or Spanish to English, English to French, that type of thing. Um, and again, it does not require a live internet connection. I think the possibilities with multimedia, I've just mentioned too with cameras, but also with sound, uh, there's, a, there's a project out of the UK that is now being, uh, being crowdsourced funded. Hopefully it will be live by uh, the spring, and that is, I think it's called Warbler. And that is the same concept of Shazam, uh, but in this case, you will place your device outside or in uh, in earshot, let's say, of a of a bird chirping, and the 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 uh, warbler software software will be able to identify the bird where that chirp is coming from. So again, the possibilities of a mobile device in the multimedia world, multimedia world are great, and I think we also need to be exploring that to the fullest extent possible. I love that idea for uh, Shazam for birds. Um, I worked uh, at the NMC on a project with National Geographic on some of their citizen science projects, and this would come in really handy. We did uh, a project uh, called Frog Watch, where we went and did frog observations, and the thing no, with frogs' ob observations is you don't really observe them, you listen for them. And then try uh, to find them. An app that was mentioned one of our in one of our planning sessions um, is called Leaf Snap, and I believe that's from Columbia University and uh, the Smithsonian. The idea: you take a picture of a leaf fall off of a tree, and it will be able to identify the leaf and provide you information about uh, that. That. So I think there's a lot of multimedia things that uh, mobile devices are really perfect for, and we'll be seeing more of in the future. Yeah, that's awesome. I'm, I'm looking forward to that. Um, we do have a question from the audience uh, that I want ter to turn to. What are some effective mobile strategies you have incorporated into your libraries? I think Joan wanted to take that. Um, I think that uh, one of the more innovative uh, approaches I've seen uh, was at Virginia Tech when uh, the librarians worked with students doing uh, multimedia projects, I think it was on World War II topics, and the students created a variety of products from the class, and then they had an exhibit in the library, a very visually oriented exhibit, and along with the exhibit, they placed some iPads so that people could come into the library and pick up the iPads and explore the exhibit in more detail. Um, 
it, within the, the library context. So I thought that was a, a really nice example. And if you don't mind, Alex, I'm just going to take a moment to go back to the question about open access textbooks and who's going to pay. Can I go ahead with that? Um, yeah, yeah, go ahead. This is, um, uh, while I'm not really familiar with the K through 12 market, in the higher education arena, this is typically being done through state initiatives or institutional initiatives. So, for example, the state of California has provided funding to uh, develop, for faculty to develop open access textbooks for a particular number, I don't remember if it's 10 or 50 or whatever, of the, for the most heavily uh, registered courses within the California University system. I don't mean um, UC, I mean the statewide, all of the levels of their university system, and including community college. This could be an enormous savings for students if each of them didn't have to buy a one or two hundred or three hundred dollar intro to chemistry or calculus or whatever textbook and the university does this through a competitive process to assure quality and that leading people are working on these initiatives. There are also programs at the institutional or system level. I know of one program at North Carolina State University in Raleigh. It's a small program, but it's uh, initiated um, through the campus and also uh, with support from the library. And a program in SUNY is also a, um, a major initiative. I'll add to the discussion, um, uh, speaking um, more to the, the quality of, of the concern about the quality um, of textbooks and what we're seeing. And I know there are uh, some. Um, uh, open access uh, projects out there right now that are providing, uh, you know, not the highest quality of text, and that becomes an, an issue um, when you move into the classroom. But I think what we are seeing are are very innovative approaches that are starting to be adopted, um, where uh, you know through uh, philanthropy. Um, we do have some philanth philanthropists who are really committed to the. Um, the need to uh, lower the cost of, of textbooks. So we've th seen things like uh, purchasing the rights to uh, the most popular statistics book out there. Uh, the OpenStax project out of Rice University um, has experienced that, where you know uh, we did have uh, a donor who said, you know what, I'm just going to buy the rights and let's put it into this online, you know, quality format. Uh, where you can do so much more with it too. Uh, you can um, more readily search across it. You can um, modularize it in ways that you couldn't do that before. So I, I think you know some of the early experiments we may have seen where quality suffered. Um, I think what we are starting to see now is uh, clearly Im vastly improved uh, quality that is lowering um, significantly the cost of text textbooks um, without compromising the quality of the content itself. Excellent. I want to um, turn it over last but not least to, uh, to Brian to, uh, to give us his take on innovative uses. Okay, well, how do you follow all of those great examples that have been given by the, um, the, the other speakers? I think like, like Gary, WordLens is amazing. You know, I, I can recall when I installed that on my mobile phone, and pointed it when I was abroad at a, at a sign, a foreign sign, and suddenly there it was in English. But that made me think about some of the broader issues. So if you think about the world that we're now living in, we all have, or can have, the equivalent of a supercomputer in our hands. And just as on the um, USS Enterprise, James T. Kirk would, could use his device to ask questions of the computer, so these days, we can use our device to access information using Google, using, using Wikipedia to address our informational queries, and we can use social media tools to interact with our social and professional networks. So for me, it's not just about a specific innovative technology. Rather, it's about the scale of the use of the technologies that we possess and the scale of those network, those nodes of users who are part of that network. So the future is here, but we can say it's fairly evenly distributed. 
because it's all in our hand, in our shirt pocket, in our trouser pocket. And I think that's the exciting um, f future. And perhaps surprising for some people on this list, it might be that that use case is using those devices in bed. And I thought it was very interesting to see the range of views that were being expressed on the Twitter channel and the Unif Unified chat, which some people were horrified at the notion and others say, yes, I use this all the time. And so for me, we will see this diversity in our user communities. So we need to be able to engage with those users in the different ways they use the technologies and the different times they'll use them. Excellent. Thank you, Brian. Um, still have some, we've got about uh, 10 minutes left. If you want to uh, pose any other questions to our panelists, you have a good sense of where they're coming from. Um, if not, then I want to kind of go towards closing thoughts uh, for this session. Um, again, uh, you can follow our Twitter uh, channel at uh, hashtag NMCHZ. If you want to communicate with, with the rest of our community, we have over 10,000 Twitter followers, so your voice will be heard in that arena. So I will turn it over to, um, to Geneva to give us some closing thoughts. Um, but please take a, take a moment to, uh, to ask any questions if you have any. But uh, Geneva, what are your closing thoughts? What, what do you see the direction of mobiles taking? What do you see you know, in 2020, for instance? Uh, OK. Uh, well, I mean, mobiles are the game changer. Um, for, for me, I, I tell people all the time, um, there's no more exciting time than right now to be working in the library, because um, we're all about information. And that information landscape has, uh, has changed dramatically. Um, you know, I came from sort of a non-traditional trajectory going into libraries. My background's in computer science, and I have worked in industry. Um, and it's really, you know, with, the, uh, with digital information, but especially as we um, make information so accessible um, through mobile devices, both um, you know, getting to the information, but also the ability to create and disseminate information on the fly, um, real time. Um, it changes everything. So I think you know, in libraries, the challenge we face is um, how do we ensure that that's meaningful? How do we keep people um, apprised of what's possible? Um, make, making sure they know about the different apps that come out. How do we engage uh, in doing more on the creative end? Um, how are, are we actually uh, doing the research with information, um, creating the new kinds of apps that are most relevant to the academic community um, and to you know, the, the students who will be using this? So I think libraries are so well positioned uh, to um, not only just leverage the mobile and everything it's bringing into us, um, but really put some context around it uh, that really helps to elevate what's going on in the classroom um, in, uh, in research in general. All right. Thank you, Geneva. So we'll turn it over to Joan for any closing thoughts you might have for us. Libraries like to create standard services that are available for a long time, and that's been, uh, they like to be very dependable for their user community, they want to be understandable to their user community, and I think that is important. However, in this environment, I think it's also just as important to pilot new types of projects using mobile devices and using content um, suitable for mobile devices. And in order to do that, I really encourage librarians to reach out to faculty and students and understand how they could get deeply engaged in some teaching and learning initiatives on their campus. So it's not necessarily a library initiative per se, but it's how they can embed themselves into new curricular developments or new research directions of their faculty. Um, I also would encourage them to do uh, more in the ways of promoting their expertise, their services, and their discoveries. A lot of people in the university environment really do not understand 21st century librarian skills, and they don't know that they can turn to librarians for partnering on some of these initiatives because they just don't get it that librarians are very conversant 
in many of these technologies and may be able to assist them in realizing their own objectives. And so I think that they, librarians need both through just personal outreach and um, promotion in many ways on their websites, through um, video screens in their libraries, through visits to uh, departmental meetings, presentations, etc. They need to better uh, market uh, their services and their expertise and do more outreach. So those are some of my thoughts. All right, thanks Joan. Some really good things to think about uh, to take away from the audience. Um, okay, so we got uh, two more folks to give us their closing thoughts. I'm going to turn it over to Gary. Give us your closing thoughts. What, what, what do you want uh, people to leave well, with, with today? My neighbors here in DC, Joan in Geneva, said it better than I could. This is a great time to be a librarian and to have that title. However, going to what Joan said, a lot of times people don't, in this day and age, and really forever, don't know what we can do and are, and are capable of doing. So let mobile be a marketing tool for you as an information professional and for your library. You need to stay on top of these issues. You need to become aware of them and market these, market yourself and your library using these tools. And that can happen either uh, via a, a quick email off to somebody saying, this is something you might want to take a look at. Um, it's, it's interesting, come by and, we can, and we'll do a demo of it for you, that type of thing. But the bottom line, whether it be mobile or non-mobile, is that people can't use what they don't know about. And in this age where there's something new every single hour of every single day, people, people need help filtering through it and they need the advice on how to use it. And these are two skills that the information professional has or should have and a great way to market yourself and your library. All right. Well, that's great. Thank you. Um, thank you, Gary, for giving us your closing thoughts. And last but not least, from across the pond, Brian, tell us, uh, tell us what closing thoughts you might have or what directions you might see for mobiles. Okay, well, I think we've all been very upbeat and positive about the opportunities that the mobile device can provide and the role of librarians in engaging with, with, with our future. But I'd like to, to really uh, conclude by raising a challenge, a, a difficult area, which has been touched on but just in passing really, which is the privacy issue. So we've got this really powerful supercomputer um, in our pocket with uh, great computational power with GPS capabilities, with recording capabilities and the like. What are the privacy aspects associated with this? Uh, how is it going to pan out in the future? And how should librarians engage in the debate? Um, particularly given that there'll be different perceptions across different countries. So the US, I think, has a very different perspective to the UK and, and Europe, where we have data protection guidelines, which uh, are different from the approaches in the States. So um, we've heard previously about the importance of curating and archiving tweets. A number of, of speakers have mentioned that. But might we see a backlash to this, as we have in part in the UK? So just last week, um, we heard about the Samaritans in the UK had developed a service for analyzing public tweets from people who were posting tweets which might be suggesting depression or suicidal tendencies. And there was a big backlash against that. And as a result, the Samaritans withdrew the service. Now, we might say the Samaritans were seeking to do a, a positive, valuable service, but there was a reaction against it. So I think we will need to think about what, how we should respond to those privacy issues. And I think it will be more complicated than the simple, we need to have informed consent and people opt in, because that just does not scale particularly in a Twitter environment. So that's my conclusion, concluding thoughts on the mobile environment. I think that's a great concluding thought, Brian, because uh, our next, um, you know, the, the Twitter idea, the, the archiving Twitter, to me, it looks, it looks like a data management ish, issue. And so we're going to be moving into uh, content management and technical infrastructure, which may be, uh, may be able to address some of those things of, okay, all the data that's being generated, how do, what do we do with it? 
Um, so I, with that, I want to close out our panel for this morning, and I want to, to thank Geneva, Brian, Gary, and Joan for joining us and giving us uh, their take on, on this, um, this uh, emphasis on mobile.